all over the internet and uh, every news media outlet out there, everybody's talking about the, the swine flu. I mean, it's, you know, uh, it actually is probably causing quite a bit of stir amongst most people. Uh, to several people I talk to jokingly say, gee, I hope I don't get it. Um, it just arrives on the scene out of nowhere, and it is kind of suspicious. And my guest today is the keeper of the the native nutrition flame, none other than Ajanis Van de Planets. How you doing? Fine. How about you? Very good. Very good. Eating raw. Yeah. Eating raw. Yes. Anyway, um, I received an interesting email from you, and I looked at it and I thought, hmm, this really deserves uh, some attention. So we're going to talk about this this theory that you have about what's going on. First of all, one one of the things I was amazed that I learned in the email was the nature of of these uh, viruses. Um, viruses are not living things, are they? No, they're not. It's not like a microbe. It isn't like a microbe at all. They are protein waste products in solvent solution, uh, and they can have uh, animal tissue in them. Now, you cannot transfer animal tissue of that nature, any kind of an animal flu. Well, let me explain what a flu is. A flu is a, uh, is a solvent detoxification. A cold is normally a bacterial detoxification where microbes eat damaged tissue that is of a waste product, and when they consume that tissue, they can consume about 50 times their weight in 24 hours, and they have a waste product of about 1% to 5%. So that's like you eating um, uh, 50 pounds of food in one day and having a 1% to 5-pound waste product to deal with the next day. That's a good janitor. <laughs> really? You know, so we want colds. Now, flus occur when people are so toxic that uh, bacteria cannot help break down the toxic waste products that there's, because there's inorganic substances like chemicals from uh, pesticides, uh, fertilize, you know, inorganic fertilizers, uh, food additives, uh, you know, Pepsi-Cola, all those sodas which are just chemical, they have nothing to do with food. Uh, when those chemicals get in the body and saturate the body and they destroy the bacteria, then our bodies have to use, have to make a solvent or many varieties of solvents to dissolve tissue. So the body may make about 300,000 types of viruses that are specific to a specific tissue within a particular cell so that the whole cell isn't, uh, its integrity isn't disrupted. So the whole cell doesn't die. It's just cleaning out, let's say, the veins in a particular area of the cell, uh, whether it be the veins for neuro neurological functions or lymphatic, which is cleansing, uh, or the blood itself within the cell. Uh, so those are specific cleansing viruses uh, for specific areas in the body. Now, no, no time does it ever get to the point where you have more than, let's say, three viruses at a particular time in any particular body. Okay. Now, when we talk, uh, when if you're in a laboratory looking at it, there's no nothing live there. You've got soaps. You've got solvents, just like we have soaps and solvents to dissolve grease off of your uh, garage floor from your car. Now, what happens when you use a solvent, you use water in relationship with it because water is the main solvent on this planet. Universal it rains, solvent, right? dissolves rock, plants can eat. Right. So water is our main solvent. If you look under an archaeological book, the first thing listed under solvent is water. Right. So we mix a compound of proteins or chemicals, which with water create a dissolution of substance. In this particular case, uh, let's say the swine. So you're talking about a specific tissue of a uh, of a pig. And, of course, a pig is not going to have a, a virus unless it is so toxic from poor feed and vaccines and all kinds of medication that it can't use its natural bacterial cleansing. And that, and that obviously is happening because if you've ever seen 
uh, animal husbandry, how it relates to swine. I mean, they feed them garbage. They literally feed them, you know, uh, garbage. Everything that is that people throw away and is rotten, they feed it to pigs. Well, that started in uh, in Egypt and Israel, you know, over uh, six thousand years ago. Pigs were used in the streets. That's why it was illegal to eat pigs. Not because they were so there was something wrong with them at first, but because they would eat anything. So all the waste products got dumped out the windows, and the pigs went around the streets eating everything. So it was illegal to eat the garbage collectors. <laughs> But because people were eating a lot of cooked foods and throwing contaminated foods out, let's say they got, that were left in silver vessels or lead cups and dishes, then of course they got contaminated with heavy metals. That was all thro- so thrown out and the pigs started getting disease. Mm-hmm. So then it was illegal to eat the pigs not only because they were the garbage collectors, but because they were diseased. Gotcha. So that had continued. So when uh, farming became a, you know, when feed became a big agricultural moneymaker, uh, companies started going to uh, other companies that made processed food like cereals, getting the waste products cheaply and then feeding them to pigs. Right. Like the, like one of the things they feed to pigs is the uh, is chicken waste chicken feces you know so they people who have chicken farms they gather all that chicken waste up they sell it to both the uh, pig farmers and the cow farmers and they feed it to those animals so yeah but that's okay oh, okay all right yeah pigs and dogs and chickens and birds eat a lot of fecal matter okay what fecal matter is fecal matter as long as the animal isn't needing chemicals and being injected with toxicity. Well, there's but that and that's the issue. That's the issue. Yeah. yeah. The feces are predigested matter that the body didn't have time to absorb all of. Right. So other animals eat those feces and they're very healthy with them. In so, fact, so 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 let, let's get back on on, on track because yeah. I'm very intrigued by this. So we have swine flu has ar- ar- arisen because we have sick pigs out there who cannot – the, the necessary viral response is inadequate for them to, to take care of their own bodies, so they develop – they manifest this swine flu, correct? I mean, correct. Okay. Now, they can, you can have 300,000 varieties of swine flu because of the different complex 300,000 different types of tissue to be uh, cleansed within a pig, just like with any, any other uh, animal organism. However, they cannot cross species. So how did we get swine flu then? <laughs> it's been made in a factory and injected. Okay. Just the way AIDS was manufactured, it was created at UCLA in 1961-62 to create cancer in laboratory animals to study cancer. Okay. Uh, well, and I don't want I don't want to get too okay. deep into that yet because I want to, I want to just I want to just elaborate one more thing here before we move there. Okay. So so in theory a virus first of all there are good viruses obviously as you just all described. All viruses are good okay. viruses. Okay. All right. So they're, and they're obviously necessary responses to something that's happening biologically in us. Correct. Um, and so the, the the swine flu virus or any of the, the the normal viruses that we catch throughout the years how are they actually do they incubate in our body and sit dormant until we spread it to someone else? I've never understood where the viruses go. The viruses are like the cicadas to me. It's a mystery. They come out once every seven years, but where are they for the, that six six point you know nine years before they come out? Where do viruses reside? Especially, okay, you know, you're working under a wrong premise to begin with, okay. and you're never going to find the answer if you do that. Okay, viruses have no nucleus. There's no respiratory system, there's no circulatory system, there's no uh, digestive system. Virus are not alive. That's like saying Tide soap is alive. Okay. They're not alive. They are solvents. They are soaps. That's so so, they what, are. so when they're not making us sick, the bad ones, when the bad ones are not making us sick, where are they or what are they doing? Well, what's happening is, like I said, we have colds, which are mainly bacterial, which go in and feed on toxic tissue that's been damaged. Waste products that we are too, we don't eat well enough, we don't eat all raw, and therefore we accumulate toxicity. So bacteria have to come in and eat that waste products because we're not, we can't keep up with all the waste. Gotcha. Okay, so that's what a cold is. 
Okay. A flu is mainly viral. Some bacteria may, some areas of your body may not be so contaminated that the bacteria, natural way that we cleanse with bacteria when we're overloaded with toxicity or waste products, bacteria will help us. But when we are so toxic that the bacteria are poisoned by the tissue from chemical inundation, then we have to make solvents. This Each cell makes a solvent. Gotcha. Each cell makes a soap to help clean itself. Okay. And it's a union. It's like a factory. They all, particular cells get together and say, let's make this for us to help clean us. So they're making a soap to do that. So there's nothing dormant about it. It's just that when the accumulation of waste is so great and you can't use bacteria, then the cells make a solvent. There you go. Okay. And that's a flu. That's okay. a virus. I want to start back at 1976, Ajanis. What what happened in 1976 with the swine flu vaccine? Well, I was 29 and living in California at the time. And uh, a Dr. Uh, McBean uh, from, um, I forgot her first name. Uh, she's an MD. Uh, she and uh, Ida Onoroff, who was a consumer advocate and was nationwide uh, syndicated on like 3,000 uh, radio networks. Right. Um, those two women uh, showed uh, that the swine flu was a hoax and that uh, the swine flu vaccine that Ford and Rockefeller pushed through, David Rockefeller was their vice president and owned controlling stock in, uh, and many pharmaceuticals. Uh, they were behind this swine flu thing. Even Gerald Ford went on and received his swine flu shot. Uh, of course, David Rockefeller didn't. <laughs> and they showed that the swine flu was a hoax and that the vaccine was going to uh, harm and kill people. And it did, in fact. Didn't some people die? I mean, a large number of people died from the vaccine. Isn't that right? Well, there were three that died right there at the poll immediately after they got it. Uh, according to Ida, I did a radio show with her. Um, she had the figures that showed 2,300 people, elderly people, died within uh, two weeks of the shot as a result of the shot. In other words, they didn't have the flu before they got the shot, and then they got the swine flu from the shot. That is the only way that that a human being can get a bird flu or a swine flu is if it is injected in them. We do not have those tissue. Once a animal product goes into our stomach, it no longer holds the animal's tissue. It completely dissolves it and makes it into human tissue. So there's no way we can get a, a swine flu or a bird flu, avian flu, um, any other flu. Years ago, they used to blame it on races, you know, the Spanish flu, the Mexican flu, and right. stuff like that. Right. Then when Rockefeller and Carnegie started taking over the universities in the early 1900s, uh, you know, shortly after that, after the Spanish flu incident, they started blaming everything on animals. Monkey flu, monkey AIDS, you know, all this stuff. They're always blaming an animal, an unnatural cre I mean, a natural creature. They're always blaming nature. You cannot get a virus into another animal. Viruses are cellularly produced in their whole form. So if a human cell creates a virus, it can only be done inside a human body or in a test tube where you have human cells. So so there's no there's no cross species of uh, of flus. You right. can't do of, of of viruses. It's impossible. Right. I mean you can get you can get a, 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 a herpes from another human being obviously, but you can't No you can't. Oh, you no, can't? that is false also. So how do people transfer herpes from one, one person to another? They don't. That is also a fallacy. That's like saying, okay, the bears in northern Mexico come out of hibernation, and then the, the next-door uh, bears come out of hibernation all the way through the United States, all the way up to Canada, and all the way up to Alaska. So you're saying that that is an epidemic. We have a bear epidemic. The swine, any kind of flu is the same thing. When the climate temperature is right, certain tissues will cleanse. 
and they may go in a seven-year cycle. They may have a six-month cycle. It depends upon the tissue and how contaminated it is. Mm. If certain tissue needs to clean out every two years, it will create, and you can't use the bacteria, you, your body will create a solvent, a virus, that cleans that particular tissue every two years, every six months, every three months, every seven years, every 12 years, depending upon that tissue and how contaminated it is. You cannot herpes, you know, that's all a fiction of the pharmaceutical industry so, to sell so, drugs. So in other words, if someone has an, a, a, a herpes, uh, let's say a, a, a genital herpes, Yes. They, 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 wouldn't they be able to transfer it to someone else, especially if it's a man to a woman since the the inside of the vagina is basically like mucous membrane? It's, 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 it doesn't have the same barrier as like the, it doesn't have a stratum, a stratum corneum like the outer dermis does. Couldn't you transfer it that way then? Well, can you uh, – is do you think Tide soap is contagious? No, it's not. I use it. <laughs> okay. Yep. Okay. Tide soap is contagious. Solvents are not contagious. I can inject it into you. And then? And then you would get sick. I got you. Okay. And that's how people get the only way people can get swine flu is if they're, they've taken animal, the, the, a bow, uh, a, uh, a pig tissue, grown it in a solvent, toxic environment, and then these swine cells, Create a virus to break itself down. Okay. Now let's. Okay. Let, okay. That it can you can inject it into a human, and then you will find those actual swine tissue in there, which is where the so virus would end up re- having some place to reside. Then. Correct. Yeah, no, okay. there's no place to reside because they're not alive to reside. Okay. It's just you have a waste product that now the body has to clean that waste product out of the body, and it's going to be very alarmed because you've got foreign tissue in there. Injected into the body. Oh, okay. That's why Guillain Barre disease. That's why anaphylactic shock occurs when you inject people with foreign debris, foreign tissue. It goes into shock. It can even die from the shock right. of foreign tissue being injected into you. Okay. All right. Now let, let me ask you a question. Now, the the in the in the email that you sent me, you you postulated that perhaps. Some of this vaccine that was created back in 76, uh, which killed so many people, it has just been vaulted. It has not been destroyed, you say, correct? Correct. They were supposed to destroy it, but uh, my understanding from one laboratory technician that I know who works at that lab, they vaulted it. They put it in a vault. Why? I mean, that, that makes no sense to me, why they would even vault something that killed people. <laughs> because there seems to be certain people out there, and even uh, President Kennedy, uh, a month before he died, said in a speech, there is a secret society that means to get rid of and annihilate certain people. Um, you know, the Bush family was connected with Hitler. They uh, financed Hitler. They're into annihilating people. Uh, to destroying, you know, races and stuff like that. Right. So you've got these people that Kennedy tried to warn us about because he was in that affluent society with many of those people. Right. And they intend to destroy a lot of the population as soon as the resources became very low. And the resources are getting pretty low, and we've got 6 billion people on the planet. And according to some of the information that's delivered to us, they want to get rid of 4.5 billion people. So this is all part of the, the New World Order uh, process that's occurring supposedly here in, in the country. Well, that's, some people call it New World or, World Order. Other people call it other things, skull and bone uh, uh, you know, groups right. from Yale. Right. Uh, yeah, so that's part of it, and they they uh, 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 gave the task of looking at overpopulation to Henry Kissinger back in the 60s, and he wrote a paper that's about 280-some pages. I think that's about 260, and he talks about the greatest way to get rid of overpopulation is to inject people with contaminated medications. Really? He wrote that? Yes. And you can look on, look at the paper, look under overpopulation, Henry Kissinger, run his search engine, and you'll come up with that paper. 
and then that was given to the NSA, National Security Association, um, also the military, and uh, you know the government secret uh, uh, services, and they all voted on a particular proposition. I forgot the number, two eighty one, something like that, and that gave the the military and secret services uh secret military divisions the right to start biological warfare uh-huh. and experimentation on uh US citizens so now these vaccine this vaccine that was manufactured that killed all those people that has since been vaulted for no apparent good reason how how would it have found its no, way? No, the apparent reason is that they want to reuse it. No, no, but I, and, and I, that's yeah. what I'm but it's not that's not a good reason. I'm saying it, it's a reason, but it's not a good reason. The, the, the reason <laughs> is a. It's you a, mean a, it's not a healthy and yeah, and, it's a sinister, passionate, yeah, and uh, it's sinister. humanitarian idea. Right, it's sinister. <laughs> it's a sinister reason. So how yeah. does it find its way to Mexico? Well, a few months ago. Uh, the U- the Mexican government gave out free flu vaccines. That's what I was going to ask. Were these people vaccinated? <laughs> yes. So obviously they were they were given this. You know, some of the swine flu vaccine was taken out of the vault, given to the Mexican authorities, probably with a lot of money in their pocket, and uh, they gave it to uh, you know some clinics, and then it was being injected into people, and then when people got such a reaction. Then it was, you know, they found uh, swine tissue in their bloodstream and in their kidneys, maybe, and their bladders. Uh, you know, that's about the only place you could really find it and detect it, right? Uh, in a in a laboratory test. So they find it, and then you have to understand that. See how this um, media campaign is so fast. Oh, I know. It's a, it's okay. explosive. It is. It already had to be have been set up. They were already ready for the cases to be discovered. You can't have eighty five cases show up and all of a sudden, oh my God! You know we've got a we've got an epidemic on our hands that could be a pandemic. To be reported, they would have to show that they're very unusual cases. They would have to even when they go to. Have the laboratory test something. It never tell. It never tests for anything that the laboratory is not directed to test for. And that's. And I, I was just going to ask you that. I mean, they, they would have had to specifically been looking for swine flu in these individuals. Exactly. Exactly. So this has all been set up. It's a whole media campaign to sell what? They're trying to sell Donald Rumsfeld's Tamiflu. I know. I'm getting getting emails. They're going to pull the swine flu out of the the vaults again and start selling the swine flu vaccine. I've been inundated with emails from Canadian pharmacies telling me to stop buying Tamiflu now before it runs out. That's amazing you said that. I got like three emails today alone from three different Canadian pharmacies. Yeah. Well, the media is recommending people use Tamiflu to fight against the swine flu. All you have to do to fight against the swine flu is never get an injection from a doctor. Yeah, there you or go. injection from anybody. Right. The only way you can get any kind of foreign animal tissue into your body is by injection. Ajahn, as you said something at the beginning of the show that you also put in the email, and I'd like you to elaborate on it. Um, you say that AIDS was created in a laboratory. Yes, in, Los, in uh, Los, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, 1961 and 62. They uh, created a uh, a mixture. Uh, what they did was combine the waste product, the virus of um, of a bovine, the uh, um, the lymph. Uh, let's see, the uh, lymphonomic virus of a sheep and the uh, leukemic virus of a bovine. These are bovines. The way you can only get a virus. Like I said, is if the tissue is so toxic with chemicals that bacteria can't do their normal janitorial work and eat the organic tissue and then reduce the waste and eliminate little waste. When your body makes a solvent, the way that to which is a virus, the solvent is a virus. It's a soap. It's not alive. It's no nucleus, no respiratory system, no digestive tract, no circulatory system. There's none of that. So it's not alive. It's a waste product. Right. It's dissolved animal tissue. Right. But, okay. But, but now, and but, 
specific animal tissue. So what they do is they take animal tissue and put it in a Petri dish in a contaminated environment, but with enough solution to keep them alive. So the cells start taking themselves apart with solvents. But what, I, I, and will eventually kill the cell. This, this virus will kill the cell. It'll kill itself by poisoning itself and taking itself apart. But but let's because let's. let's I want to stay. I want to stay. I want to stay on track here for a second because yeah. I, 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 we're kind of going back to what we talked out about in the first half of the show. I want I want to ask you to elaborate more about the AIDS virus. So the AIDS virus is created in in a lab at UCLA. For what purpose would they create something like that? They create. They were trying to create. According to the records that I got to see. And they were discovered by a Dr. Robert Strecker. Um, I'm a nutritional doctor, got my PhD in nutrition. Uh, Dr. Strecker has like four doctorates, and one is in biochemistry and virology. Right. Now, the only way that you can make a virus is to put it in a Petri dish with the animal tissue. Okay, the only way that animal tissue can ever get into a human is if it is injected right. or another animal. Right. So what they did was they incubated these two diseases from both a sheep and a cow, the leukemic virus of a cow, the bovine, and the lymphonomic virus of a sheep. They put those two together and created a new kind of uh, deadly um Biological warfare disease. So now, you, they did that. Was that so the they, reason for it? Were they trying to come up with a new biohazard, a new biological warfare? Well, it, they could have been the reason, but they put in their paperwork it was to create cancer. It was to force cancer in laboratory animals so they ah, could study cancer. Okay. That is very suspicious reasoning to me. To come up with some yeah, something because there's lots of like there's that. already lots of agents out there that will cause spontaneous tumor and cancers in, in rats. Exactly. I mean, you can put cadmium in it, and you right. can have kidney cancer in weeks. You right. know, overloading with cadmium. There are lots of ways. So this was a suspicious reasoning for me, uh, to my thinking, but it was done. Uh, Doctor Strecker uh, called his brother, who was an attorney, and said, "This is where it leads. Follow it." So his brother checked the uh, NSA, the War Department, and yes, that information had been sent to those departments, and it was allowed, it was given the green light to be used um, in experiments. So he found out the experiments were un undesirables. They figured that in these particular um, committees right. that the undesirables were homosexuals. Right. Now, how could they administer this to homosexuals to see the, the consequences oh, of I, this, this particular formulation? Well, you just have to find homosexuals who are also intravenous drug users and then, and then spike the heroin or the speed or whatever they're shooting with some of this stuff, I guess. No, you still can't get a good population that way. Okay. What they found was that in Los Angeles, New York City, Houston, um, and San Francisco, that 90% of the people who were being treated for hepatitis were homosexuals because they used a lot of drugs, oh. damaged the liver. So hepatitis is a viral detoxification because there's so many chemicals in the liver, your bacteria from the liver can't clean it. So your body has to, your, the liver cells have to make solvents, which are again viruses. So it makes a self-cleansing cleansing substance. So your hepat all of your hepatitises are diseases trying to reverse a toxic condition where the liver is about to stop working completely. When you get to hepatitis, that means your liver is in terrible shape. So no they, bacteria can help you. So you're saying they contaminated the hepatitis vaccine? B vaccine. Oh. With the, this AIDS virus. And they injected, that's why 10% of the population in those cities who got AIDS were not homosexuals, they were heterosexuals. Oh, my God. Then they went and put it in the smallpox vaccine. The U.S. government and the U.K. government donated hundreds of millions of dollars of small vax, vax, smallpox vaccine to African countries. Then all of these do do good meaning groups, you know, go out and administer and going to save the world by giving all these vaccines to African children and everybody to save their lives. 
were, you know, from smallpox were given this AIDS virus in the smallpox vaccine. That's amazing. 125 million were donated. How many cases of, of uh, AIDS were propped up in Africa within a year? I don't know that number, but I remember it was like half the population. 95 million. Right. 75 million people died. Then what the U.S. government and the U.K. government did went to those countries and said, listen, we have, you know, help for AIDS. We have a chemotherapy, which is AZT. Right. We have chemotherapy that we can help your people with. We can help you stop this disease. We can treat your people. We'll bring the medical in, but you will owe us a lot of money. Now, they charged so much money that no way these countries could pay back. So, when all of was done and said and done, and all these people were dead, and very few people ever came through the AIDS without death, the U.S. government, and U.K. government says, "Oh, you owe us this much money. If you can't pay it, you owe us your country's resources." Wow! So they turned over the country's resources to be run by the World Bank. So that to, we took over, the U.S. government and the U.K. government took over 27 African countries with that AIDS hoax and, oh, yeah. and, and inundation. That's amazing. It's just like they use a different kind of warfare to usurp another country's, you know, resources. Shocking. It's like war, like, you know, uh, any, uh, the Spanish, you know, uh, the Roman. It's the a stealth, it, but it's a stealth. You're, they're waging a stealth war, because, uh, almost like a Trojan horse war, because they are being perceived as they're being invited in. They're being perceived as the saviors, but they're really the ones creating the problem so that they can come in and 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 finish the job. You know, Absolutely. What, and if you read the book, uh, uh, Confessions of a Financial Hit Band, I think that's the title. Uh, it talks of this man who worked for the U.S. government and the CIA. They went in and, uh, you know, loaned great amounts of money to foreign countries, foreign governments that could never pay it back and then would take over their resources. Wow. Something that I never gave much thought to. You know, I was, a, I was born in 1958, and um, I, I don't have the mark on my arm from a polio vaccine, so I don't know that I ever got it. But I remember it was very popular back then. And you pointed something out that was really interesting. While people were running to get the polio vaccine, um, there were large numbers of people who were not getting the vaccine, and they were not seeing the outbreak in polio. For instance, the Amish and the Mennonites, uh, they didn't go for the polio vaccine back then, and their kids didn't get polio. And, and the other interesting thing is all these third-world countries, why are they not unrun, uh, overrun by polio today if they're not getting these vaccines? Well, because it's, a, it's another hoax. Uh, polio uh, is a disease that comes out maybe every 28 years, and it'll have its peak and, and diminish. Sometimes it will be strong, but it's usually every maybe 240 years of polio will create, uh, you know, a, a, a severe uh, reaction in humans. Now, polio is a poliomyelitis. Everybody has it. It's a bacterial uh, detoxification of the spinal cord. So it usually takes many, many generations before the spinal cord will get that toxic to where, uh, you know, a whole race will have to go through a heavy detoxification at the same time. That doesn't mean it's contagious. It means that the toxicity builds up all in the whole race at a particular time, and everybody needs to cleanse their spinal cords at the same time. So it's not a contagious thing. But the detoxification came necessary right after canned foods came into being during the World War II. So 1945 to 1947, canned foods became a regular staple of, of our supermarkets. So people were eating tin metal combinations, amalgams of, of metals that were Im implanting themselves in the spinal cord because the nervous system uses a lot of metallic minerals to conduct electricity and transfer light. So all of these free radical metals coming from tin were getting into the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So by 19, mid-1950s, we had a huge amount of cases of polio. And they weren't in the people who were eating normal food. They were in the, the more uh, affluent neighborhoods who were living on canned foods like, you know, my parents did. They loved the new era of technology. Right. So they came up with a polio vaccine, and that was breeding polio tissue, monkey spinal cords, um, you know, they would de- de- decompose that tissue and then say this is going to prevent disease. And in that was liquid mercury, liquid aluminum, formaldehyde, ether, and detergent. Those were just five of the 68 ingredients. All the other ingredients are, in- are labeled inert. Inert for what? And what is an inert matter? doesn't mean it's not non-toxic. Right. It just means that it's not indicated as part of the solution of the problem given. Hmm. But it's very toxic material. So you have all of these toxic substances. Now, when the polio vaccine came out in 1958, it was a year after uh, the the. Polio almost became extinct. It was down to 1% of the normally infected population that had proceeded before it. Not 1% of the whole population, but all of the people who had been infected, it was down to 1% of the highest rate of infection. So they introduced the vaccine on the heels of it going away on its own, in other words. Not only the heels, actually the trail. (laughs) So they took complete... You know, credit for getting rid of polio. It was already gone. And and you point out that in other countries, polio is not a problem, and they don't get polio vaccines. Correct. Do we still give children polio vaccines today? Absolutely. They get three in their lifetime, minimum of three. And after I got my third, I got uh, angina pectoris and diabetes. Oh, wow. Within days after my third vaccine. So you obviously had a reaction from, and that's another right. thing. I mean, that you know, they're pushing that uh, that what is that human papilloma virus uh, vaccine on on a lot of young girls now, and they're trying to make the parents feel uh, guilty if they guilty, don't let their. Yeah. Kids. I would yeah. never let my kids get a vaccine of any type whatsoever. Absolutely, they're all poison, and there's no record that they ever prevent anything. When I was in Paris studying at the Sorbonne, uh, Pasteur's material. Um, I had to have somebody help me because I don't do well in French. <laughs> and, uh, and it was all written in French, of course. Right. And he, not one of the animals he ever vaccinated lived. Really? Not one ever lived. They all died of anaphylactic shock or severe flus. That's shocking. Yeah. And so, and so there was no, there's no real foundation for the, uh, that supports that these vaccines do anything then. Correct. Now, how can you say, oh, you're likely to get, you know, some kind of disease and you take this, you're going to prevent it, when m- many people who get the vaccines actually get the disease? Anyway, In right. fact, the, the, there was 1% of all that. In 1958, there were three states and one city that kept record of polio uh, cases, and they found that the numbers went all the way up to 484% increase in polio. All of them, all of the cases among people who had received three or more vaccines. Wow. Polio vaccines. So when you're injected polio tissue into somebody, you're going to give them polio. Well, I, and see, I've never gone for, I, 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 not never. I went for a flu shot. When I was a young adult, when I lived in Las Vegas, my mother called me and said, you know, the flu is going around. You should go get a flu shot. And I never thought about it. And I thought, okay, I'll go. You know, I got a flu shot. And three days later, I had all the symptoms of a flu. I was sick and down and out for about two days. And You I, were and given I, a flu. Yeah, and I thought to myself, I'm never going to do that again. Well, that would yeah. be stupid. Absolutely is stupid. There's not one person that doesn't get sick from a flu vaccine. They may get a little nauseous, they may have diarrhea, they may have some vomit, they may get dizzy, they may get very sleepy for days. Everybody has a reaction. Yeah, that's amazing. Everybody. Because everybody's yeah. being given the flu at that point. And the chances yeah. are that your reaction is the same reaction you would come in, con- I mean, you would come in contact with if you had the, the straight flu injected in you anyway. So you, you probably would survive it anyway. It really wouldn't matter. 
Correct. Well, and, and, and really, the key to all of this, and we, you know, we can come back uh, around and talk a about it. A lot of it. Well, let me also say one thing yeah, sure. that's very important. There's a lot of your viewers, I mean your uh, listeners, who are saying, well, look at the Spanish flu vaccine. The Spanish flu was the first vaccine ever made. It was given to people all over the world. Only people who got the vaccine got that flu. That's and that was by, I forgot the man's name. He wrote Man's Correct Diet. It's a book. And it was written in 1928, something like that, when he had gathered all of the information. He was an engineer for a health company. And he proved that the vaccine created the disease. And anybody treated by the medical profession would die. Yeah, and that's the truth. Because they would compound it with penicillin and other d- drugs. It's amazing. It's amazing. And it, it, just, it just continues to uh, go on. And it, the, the, my biggest frustration is that, you know, the medical orthodoxy does not look at people like people. They just look at us as a, 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 a as way. As organisms. A, yeah, a, ve- a vehicle for them to achieve what they want to achieve, which is basically it's a parasitic relationship. They want to us to depend on them forever and ever, buy their drugs and and, and they have lots of cars and swimming yeah, pools yeah. and big families it's disgusting. and stuff like that. It's yeah. Disgusting. So there's the key. If you never want to get the swine flu, don't go get the swine flu vaccine. There you don't go. get any injection. You yeah. never know what's in them. Well, I inject myself with testosterone, part of my hormone replacement uh-huh. therapy. No, so. I'm talking from a doctor. Yeah, there you go. There you go. But but I mean, <laughs> I, I and I and I actually buy my uh, testosterone from a laboratory that I know of, and uh, mm-hmm. I trust them implicitly. But no, I know you're right. And and the, and the farther you stay away from most physicians, I mean, there's some. There's a handful of good physicians out there. Don't get me wrong; they're not all bad. But the ones that just follow the the company line, you know, they they, they don't use their own brains. They they just do what the black book says to do for this and that. Those are the ones you have to stay clear of. 